Um, I, I'm going to talk about what we uh, currently have issues in open, open source licenses. Um, I'm from the site of Cologne, and my colleague Karina, which actually um, submitted the talk, <laughs> she's from Berlin. So the German Aerospace Center is a research organization of the German government. We are doing research on transportation, space research, energy, trans and aeronautics. And we're also a German space agency, among other things. Uh, where we distributed this in Germany with 20 sites currently, 8,000 employees and about like 5,500 so are, are scientists actually. And also if we have Brussels uh, uh, offices outside of Germany like here in Brussels or in Paris, Tokyo and so on. And within our lab, within the German Aerospace Center, we have a lot of software and a lot of this is open source and free software. This is actually a picture two years ago here at Foster, which I took, um, of somebody you might know. Um, so the software scene and software development at DLR is very diverse. So we have many, many domain scientists from aeronautics and space and so on. All, all of them have certain thoughts and things in their minds, and usually they are implementing their, their ideas into software packages. Um, that's the basic way of working. And so software development at DLR at our lab is very important. Like 1,500 people are working full-time on software development. Um, that means we spend 150 million euros per year personal cost for software development, and it makes us one of the um, largest uh, software companies, if you will, in Germany at least. Um, but um, actually, we are not a company. It's, um, and the characteristics, um, the people who are developing software, and this is very similar to other other similar organizations like research labs and maybe also universities is that our developers um, have no training in software development at all. So some of them had like programming courses at universities, like co course in, in C programming or Python or um, other colleagues have courses in Fortran programming and so on. And um, the problem is that um, they have no, no education but now have to do um, a huge amount of the time you're doing in, in, spent in, in software projects, actually. And, yeah? So, what is their expertise? Why do you hire them? Are they all space experts? Or? Yeah, space experts, domain experts for aeronautics and transportation and all this kind of stuff. And they do just have to do programming work, work because this is essential in every scientific field today, like especially in the field of where we are doing a lot of data science and so on. And a lot of these people just Many of these people, or for our colleagues, don't um, work on huge software projects, actually, but they do something like exploratory programming, like small scripts or entering a bit, bit of code, bits of code in, in, in Jupyter notebooks and so on. And we use a lot of um, technologies, um, more than 30 programming languages, like with Fortran and Ada and MATLAB and Python and so on, and uh, a lot of we use a lot of open source software, and we produce a lot of open source software with many different licenses. And that's where part of the problems come in. Um, so we have a huge number of software projects. One of our problems is that we don't have a real overview about our software projects. So it's very heterogeneous from the organization point, and it's very hard to get an overview, and um, it's just not possible today. And Regarding open source software, um, usually the software starts within the lab and then it's exposed as an, with an open source license uh, to the outer world. Here are three examples from the Earth system modulation field, from traffic simulation and from aerospace design. And these software packages are used from other researchers um, or from other companies. And, uh, contributors come from also from other research labs and universities and also from companies. Um, problems that we have or that we had in the past is that we published open source, um, that we had issues with licenses, so um, things which, are not, which are, I'm not going to really talk about, but uh, one of the things that happened is that um, our government, Germany, gave software away to another country um, and stated it was open source. It is open source and it, it was not. It was the software of, of our lab, of DLR. And, um, well, there was a journalist from the Spiegel magazine and he discovered that and just 
um, there was a little well, trouble coming up. Um, so we fixed this with a lot of effort, and then we, uh, we had a couple of other um, problems with where the license compatibility, compatibility was not fulfilled and, and so on. And in general, colleagues didn't know about open source licenses um, and which license to, to choose and so on. And um, the problems that we have are not as problematic as like with our hardware. This is much more expensive, but it's also, um, also not nice and we try to avoid it. And like in 2012, there was an, a letter by our CIO who sent an, um, a letter to all the employees with some tips and warnings about uh, open source and dealing with open source licenses and so on. And, but the situation is, is really complicated because um, if you are a developer and especially a an, an researcher which are not interested in, in software engineering and programming and in, um, in, in, in license issues, it's really hard to understand um, licensing and open source lic licensing in, special, um, in particular. Um, for example, at the ICPC conference last year, there was an, a talk about a study. Um, do software developers understand open source licensing? And, um, well, the general conclusion is um, that developers understand open source licensing if, if uh, there is one license involved, but it's really if they struggle if there are multiple licenses involved. And this is usually in most, most projects, this is the case, that we don't have just one license, but we have multiple licenses. And we have also issues of license compatibility and so on. And um, well, our, what we try to, um, to do um, in the past years is to um, take took some actions for our, for our colleagues, for our employees, for example, information, we provide information, trainings, knowledge exchange possibilities, and consulting and, and uh, support. And I'm going through all of this briefly. So information and trainings, what we set up is, was a, a training for open source licensing. It's not about developing software, it's about only about the legal issues um, on licenses. And um, it's a regular training in our, at our education program of DLR, so every employee can sign up um, every year. And it's a short training, only four hours, like from 10 to, to 3 p.m. or so. And it's run by two persons, a legal expert for the real um, legal topics and um, a second person is a software engineer. And together we are presenting the basic stuff about licensing and how to select open source licenses and how to use open source software. And it took place in various sites at, at DLR throughout the years uh, and a couple of people from different institutes attended. And the people who came there, uh, most of them didn't have very deep knowledge about open source licenses. So that's our main audience with this trainings. So when we um, asked for the training, um, so nobody said that he or she has deep knowledge about licensing issues and the topics of the training. Um, we also asked them for the expectation on the trainings. Um, we got a lot of, um, a lot of feedback. Um, what people want to learn, overview about licenses and so on, uh, learn about the legal basics. And the feedback after the training shows us that um, we fulfilled the expectations of our colleagues. At least um, the ratings were good or all very good. So this, I think this is, this is um, turned out very well. And what we also did is like a brochure, like um, real, in real paper, and information about legal, legal basics, um, it's um, developed by a law firm in Germany from Berlin and um, funded from DLR sources. And the, the open source brochure contains um, a couple of um, chapters and sections about um, distribution of unmodified code and modified code. It's, it has uh, lists of all liabilities for licenses, which are, for licenses which are widely used at DLR for example, the BSD or Apache license and so on, and covers, of course, the, um, concepts like um, copyleft and so on. 
And this is one page of the open source brochure which we distribute in our lab is we have checklists so colleagues can go to this checklist and mark all the, all the points if they, the projects fulfill these, um, these points. And it also has a lot of information about very different things related to open source and software development. And it also has some kind of decision trees for, for example, for choosing a license for their own projects. Um, this brochure is in German only currently, but we are working on an English version uh, on a Creative Commons license, which we can distribute in the future, like this year somewhere. Um, next thing is knowledge ex exchange between, um, between our colleagues. The first thing that comes in mind when you think about knowledge exchange as a wiki and also we set up a wiki in our central wiki installation um, where we have wiki pages for for everything and there's now an, there's since a couple of years there's an open source section with question and answer uh, section and information and link lists and so on and this is like the single source of information single point of information for open source issues at DLR and <clears throat> this is I think this is very common and standard, but what we also set up is kind of, um, kind of workshops, knowledge ex exchange workshops. Um, this is for peer-to-peer -peer exchange between our colleagues, which come to a, a place together. Um, and we have these knowledge exchange workshops for different topics at DLR, like for software engineering and visualization and photonic systems and so on, but also for open source and also <laughs> open science and open access and these kind of topics. Um, this is, this is um, well, currently open for any DLA employee. Currently we have a limit of 60 participants per workshop. Um, this is an interactive program, um, short lectures, and everybody has to introduce it uh, himself uh, or herself, and we have, have lightning talks and discussions in small groups and so on. So, for example, last year everybody had, had to make a small poster introducing herself. Actually, this is this is Karina who was supposed to talk here now. Um, and then we can go around to the posters, and everybody can ask questions and explain what he wants and what he what he offers and so on. And well, of course, sometimes it's hard to understand what people <laughs> offer. Um, that is also one of the problems that we have. That we have very strange minds in our in our lab and. They are thinking about, about concepts like um, how to integrate satellites into an industry for all infrastructure and um, well, then if you have to, to go to them and ask about the open source licensing, then they basically explode. So this is the um, interesting part of the job. And um, also we, had, we gathered the feedback for our, for our workshops and for the different topics and also um, for the expectations that people have and the most um, um, important expectation was to get knowledge from other people within the, the same lab, with, from colleagues which have the same problems. And <clears throat> um, the feedback form showed us that we fulfilled this, this expectation. So we will continue with this kind of workshops, the internal workshops for knowledge, knowledge exchange. And we have a lot of findings which came out of these workshops for, um, which we can use for further actions and further activities within DLR. But very general findings which we uh, in part already know before, um, that we use open source a lot and that this, um, people want to um, um, publish open source more and more and so on. And <clears throat> there were also critics of open source software and we, um, we discussed these topics too, for example, for like things like earning money and the, the business aspects and so on. And one of the things was that we, we, we needed a formal process definition and how to, how to, uh, what to do for, for employees if they want to publish the software as open source. This was missing, it's now available because we developed, we developed it in the last months, last year. So this was one of the outcomes of these kind of software and knowledge exchange workshops. <clears throat> and of course, another topic that we, that we set up, another area is um, 
help and consulting um, if people at DLR have problems related to any kind of licensing or any kind of open source um, issue. Um, there are actually a couple of departments who might help for like the technology marketing division. They help in general licensing questions and uh, topics like property rights and so on. We have the legal department, of course, who can support them for general legal questions or copyright questions. And we have a, some, a software technology division who helps in um, license selection and all things related to um, development. And of course, uh, during, the, uh, during um, these um, support actions, we have typical topics are what are criteria for choosing an open source software or what are best practices for your own open source project and so on. And what we set up for this, and this, we found out that this is also very important, just a very simple single um, email address, open source at DLRD, and any employee can send an email to this address and um, we will help these guys. And, well, of course, everybody from outside of DLR can send us emails to this address and we will probably help these guys. Um, yeah, and what we also did is um, that, our, that we choose a couple of licenses which were approved by our legal department which um, colleagues and employees can use without further asking anybody. Like the simplified BC license, the Apache license, Super and O, and Eclipse public license. These two licenses are really widely used at DLR for a variety of projects. And of course, we have an, a lot of other pro, um, licenses which we, are, which we are using, but if one of the colleagues want to use or one of these licenses, they don't have to ask anyone, anybody again. Um, and another thing, we decided a couple of years ago that we don't go and um, develop our own license. A uh, couple of related institutions are doing this, like the European Space Agency and NASA and so on. They all have their own open source license or their own license. And we decided just that the um, existing licenses, the existing open source OZ approved licenses are, are enough for our projects. And that's, that's it. That's, um, and it, I mean, it works in practice. So there's really no need for our own license. And for support and, um, and help also, we have a section in the, in the wiki and um, the, where, where there's a discussion board and Q&A &A section which is where we, where we um, frequently use currently. So I think it's I'm through. So the key messages of my talk here are that um, we at DLR, um, our strategy was regarding to open source licensing is that we first offered specific information to our, to our um, employees and um, provided room and space and time for peer-to-peer -peer discussions and for knowledge exchange. And then afterwards, just afterwards, we came up with um, formal process definitions and, and um, something was just given from the board of directors and so on. And we have positive evaluations for our, all of our actions and so we can continue on this on this um, road and also other um, research organizations, at least in Germany, but also currently in the US, are like copying this kind of, um, this kind of way that we are going. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you. And if you have questions, just ask. Thanks. Yeah, no. Uh, yes. You say that um, you like to allow, you know, spread of knowledge rather than <coughs> directives from above. But it seems like when it comes to choosing licenses, you're not actually giving your engineers that much choice. Obviously, one of the big choices in license choice is whether you use copyleft or not. And the three approved licenses by default had no copyleft, no copyleft, and <coughs> I think a little bit of copyleft. So one of the most difficult decisions is not, in fact, in front of them. So um, I can see how that would make it easy. But um, yeah, do you have any, any comments on that? And 
I... Maybe you just decided not to use copyleft licensing. Yeah. DLR. Uh, that's just a question that's too long to repeat. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. So the, list, so the question is basically why do we choose only licenses which do not have copyleft in it? And this was not by intention. So um, we just came up with these few licenses because um, a lot of people ask for specifically the, these licenses. And uh, it's um, totally possible that we add another license, like the GPL or other licenses to this list. It's just the current state. So, okay? So in, is this the list that you're producing software or the list of licenses that you're using? The, the license that you're using for software that we initiate. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think you was first. Um, just to get a feel for how, how big an organization, what organizations do that work for them, it's, like, it's a function of how big they are. How big roughly is DLR in terms of number of employees? Oh, the question is how big are steel iron employees? We are currently uh, more than 8,000 employees. Big yeah. Okay, you? So, uh, do you have uh, like a public domain mechanism in Germany? I'm sure that you can have like the global jobs and uh, reduce the rights or the rights or anything else. No. Do we have a uh, public domain in Germany? Can you dedicate and call the public domain? As far as I know, we cannot do this in Germany. Yeah, but I'm not, not the legal expert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I could understand, uh, the three software licenses you list are the, uh, I mean, uh, they are uh, licenses your programmers could choose without passing through the legal department. Yes. But for instance, if I were uh, Yes. So, so the question is, can people choose a copyleft license and um, if you have, ex have experience if with employees doing that? Yes, we have a lot of experience. Many projects of DLR have, for example, the GPL, LGPL or other copyleft licenses. And um, it's not only legal department where we have go to go through, but also actually um, you must convince your, your manager actually. Uh, but that's a side note. But in general, a lot of people did that before, yes. Also for copyleft licenses. On which basis is that accepted or No, we look into, yeah, okay, in what, but basic is it, the question is in what basic is it accepted or not? So we, in each case, we look into the specifics of the project and does it make sense? Does the license make sense? And in some cases, we, like my department or other people, um, suggest other licenses, and sometimes we just say, yes, this is, this is okay, and so on. Yeah. But especially this project is currently a bit more formalized, with also with decision trees and so, so that people can make the, the step for choosing license by themselves more and more. Okay. Okay. Yes. <coughs> So the question is, do we provide the actions and services to external parties? Yes, sometimes. For example, um, we did it a, a, a couple of times for other research institutions in Germany, universities and, and research labs. And also in one case for a company, but this is not our main focus. Okay, yes? Sorry, can, can you repeat? Why not push every, all the DLR programmers to one license as opposed to permitting this? Ah, okay. License? So, yeah, so the yeah. question is why do not push everybody to use these licenses? For one license. One license, especially one license, yes. No, this, this, is a, this is a strategy which we tried out before, 
in for rice technologies, for programming languages, for licenses, for in, uh, um, development infrastructure, and in a really free mind research environment like DLR, this is not going to work. So people want to do their own stuff, their own way, their own license, and so on. And so we have to provide offers, but we, um, we do not make pressure on them to, use, to choose just one single license. We don't want to. No, that doesn't conform to our way of free thinking and, and do what you like, basically. Okay? Thanks.